Is this new windlass saber epic and truly the best reproduction saber we've ever seen? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Nick Thomas and welcome back to the Academy of Historical Fencing. And today I'm going to be taking a first impressions look at the Windlass 1796 Light Cavalry Sabre. So, Windlass have been making reproduction swords for a very long time. And frankly, they have, um, I would say, a mixed reputation in terms of they're kind of, they're quite affordable. They can be quite tough and good enough for cutting, but they vary in terms of handling characteristics and, and, and how good those handling characteristics are from model to model and, and they can be a bit inconsistent in that regard so you have to choose quite carefully. Now what we have here today with the 1796 Light Cavalry is an entirely new philosophy from Windlass and frankly from any uh, reproduction sabre maker yet and this is a hugely important release for the simple reason of how they've approached it. The, the approach to making this uh, reproduction is very very different and that's what I'm going to discuss first before we go on to um, establishing whether they were successful in that endeavour. So, with most reproduction swords, the way it works is a company generally looks at photos um, online, maybe of a, of a uh, museum or something like that, and they just make a rough facsimile based on a photo. They might have some rough measurements of length and things like that, and they make a rough facsimile, and it's, as a result, usually not too great. Now, a couple of years ago, I made a video on why reproduction sabers are absolute junk. And by reproduction sabers, I mean reproductions that are intended to be sharps, okay? So actual reproductions to, of a functional cutting weapon, or, or in this case, a cut and thrust weapon, uh, and not, say, a training sword, because the training swords are a completely different category. They're built differently and designed for a different purpose. So we're only here talking about exact reproductions of sharp weapons. And I made that video and just said that every reproduction saber that you could get was pretty much junk and that's near enough true unless you forked out a lot of money for a um, an incredible custom sword now a few things have changed since that video not much actually but a few um, and significantly this saber has taken a different approach so instead of just looking at some photos you know google a few photos of a sword and copy it which was never going to result in a good training sword windless went to Matt Easton, a scholar of Gladiatoria, and got him to source a typical example of a 1796 light cavalry sabre, an antique, and then they copied it exactly. So fundamentally, we have a completely different design approach here. Uh, and as a result, if they have done that successfully, if they've copied it very accurately, you're going to have a reproduction sword that is bang on correct um, and, in, and arguably isn't even a reproduction in the sense that we typically think of it, because again, a reproduction is just a company copies and makes a rough facsimile of a sword, but with this windlass, they have done an exact copy of an existing sword. Now, that is how these swords were originally made. These pattern swords, the way they worked is the, the, a, a standardized design was created and then given a wax seal, and that was given essentially as, well, as the pattern, as the example for other makers to copy. So if a company makes an exact copy of an exact original sword, that is the way the original swords were made. So you can arguably say it's not even a reproduction anymore. It's a modern production run of a patent sword. That's pretty fascinating, to me at least. So <clears throat> why is this so hugely important and why were Sabres a few years ago absolute junk and why is this one so different? It's not just that they've copied it 100% because that doesn't really tell the full story, okay? The biggest problem that sabers have in terms of reproductions is that they need a lot of distal taper, or at least most kinds of sabers do. Again, saber is a hugely broad category of swords, but let's just consider, you know, this type of saber, this kind of British like cavalry saber. They look absolutely savagely brutish, and the reality is they were. They were famous for cutting limbs off, cutting heads off. They were absolutely brutal in terms of cutting power. However, they are nothing as um, cumbersome as you might think based on a photo and based on most reproductions. Because this looks like a massive amount of metal a long way from the hand and therefore you'd think it handles like a club. But the reality is they have a massive amount of distal taper. So let me put the scabbard down for a moment. And I am going to kind of waffle on a lot here because it's, it's hugely important as to what they were aiming for and what we got and why other makers just haven't achieved this yet. Okay, so profile taper is uh, 
the change in width in the blade as you see it from the flat, okay? And as you can see with the light cavalry saber, 1796, there just isn't much. Now they vary a little bit from model to model, but as a general rule, they thin a little bit in the center and then flare out a little bit more towards the tip. But overall, they just do not have much profile taper of any kind. And this is the problem with reproductions, is that, say, a lot of medieval swords have a broad blade here and they taper into a fairly fine point. So you've got quite an acute profile taper and that can hide a lot of sins, okay? Because simply put, that triangle shape means you end up with a lot of mass here and not too much up there. And so even if they don't have the correct blade geometry compared to the originals, they can get away with it because of the shape that they've got of that acute profile taper. Now, with a saber like this, the originals have a massively thick, what we'd call shoulder, which is the, um, the back of the blade where it meets the guard a very thick shoulder. So most British swords of this era are um, in the region of about eight to 10 millimeters thick here. And then very, very thin at the tip here. So most originals uh, of this time, British swords, are between one and two millimeters here at the, uh, at the tip, which is incredibly thin. Now, why don't companies do that? Well, the simple reason is it's expensive and it's difficult. So with swords manufactured today, they start with a flat piece of steel and they mill or grind it down. And if you want to start with a 10 mil piece of steel, well, for a start, you've got to have a lot of steel to begin with and you've got to remove a lot of material. So steel costs are higher, manufacturing costs are longer and, and higher, okay? It's not just that though, it's that there's not just distal taper involved, there's complex distal taper, okay? So with these British swords, they didn't just start at say let's say t uh, nine or ten millimeters here and two down there and they didn't have an even taper from there to the tip they actually have a complex distal taper so they start at that you know nine ten mil they taper down fairly quickly so they usually are down to about five millimeters just about here so you've got a really thick strong um uh, uh tang shoulder okay um or spine of the blade here and then it tapers down very quickly and then it keeps tapering and as a result you've got a very, very nimble, agile blade. And this is what Windlass has done. So not only are they more accurately representing the blade shape, the grip shape, the guard shape, the scabbard, and every detail much more accurately than the other reproductions, they're also going for this complex distal taper so that the sword not just looks correct, but handles correctly to the originals. And this is absolutely huge because most reproduction swords just go for a rough look of the antique and this windlass is now trying to be not only an exact look but an exact handling characteristics and I think that's absolutely massive. So um, if I now go back to uh, an original, okay, so if you see my photos that I use throughout this video, I'm comparing um, the windlass light cavalry saber to um, a cold steel, to originals, um, to get a, a kind of overall feel for what it's like and how well they achieved this. So I think the two most important swords to compare it to are the Cold Steel 1796, because that is the best light cav that's been made up until this point and the most common that people will buy for actual test cutting, because there are a few kind of like cheapy junk wool hangers that people did buy. But in terms of a functional sword that you can do test cutting with and use as a sword was intended, Cold Steel was the one everybody went to. And then an original, um, and this isn't my smartest, nicest original, but I think it's the most important one to compare to. And the reason for that is this is standard in every way, Trooper 1796, and importantly, it's made by Osborne. So the 1796 Light Cavalry Sabre was designed by the maker Osborne of Birmingham with the help of Gaspard Le Marchant. And this one is an Osborne. So this is the OG, absolutely classic 1796. So if you want to compare a reproduction to a sword, this is the one you want to compare it to. Now, with antiques, with all pattern swords, you will find variation. So you don't necessarily want to look at every detail of this and say, well, the Windlass didn't do it quite like that. No, because Windlass clearly didn't copy an Osborne. They copied just another typical example. There were loads of makers of the light cavalry sabre in this era. Um, Osborne was just the kind of the first one to do the design. And it is a good one to compare, but again, don't be quite too harsh in a few little details because the reality is, say the shape of the P guard, the shape of the grip, the size and shape of the langets, 
even the curvature of the blade and the profile taper, they do vary by little bits here and there between different makers and different batches. So this is a good comparison, but it doesn't mean, you know, that's the be all and end all. So that being said, let's take this now as the atypical example of a 1796 light cavalry saber. You can see it's fully intact. It's not missing any part of it. There's no major, there's no chips out of it. The leather washer is still there. This is a completely, um, as it was made besides a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, patination, um, as it came out the factory. And so it's a great comparison. So specs, well, in terms of length and curvature, the windlass is exactly the same. So let's just get that out of the way. What we're really gonna want to look at is weight, balance, distal taper, handling characteristics. Weight, Osborne, 870 grams, windlass, 835. So, you know, a little bit under, um, although I will say that from two other reviews that I've seen, theirs came out at 840 and 855 grams. So I think mine is just towards the um, lower end of the spectrum. I'd love to see some more uh, examples of weight to see what the actual you know spectrum is like but that would suggest that they're quite consistent but that mine is slightly towards the lower end so yeah 870 now original light cavalry sabers of this kind they can go down to about 800 grams which is not so common but happens and they can push up to almost a kilo you know around about 950 grams something like that is usually the upper limit um, and let's not talk about the blushes there because they are built tougher that's but that's a different sword even though it's based on it okay Right, so balance, 17 centimeters uh, on this Osborne original, and most uh, troopers examples I've handled are around about 17 centimeters, which is quite far forward, but it's not insane. Um, by insane, I mean there are some reproductions out there which push it way further. So cold steel, for example, is um, a good bit further on, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment because I've got a cold steel here with me. So what do we have? Well. You can see that the, the shape of the langets here is, I would say, not the best bent, although, you know, that's mild steel. I would be tempted to slightly reshape that because I think that's a slightly harsh bend. Not a big deal. Anyway, the ears looking good, back strap nice, grip is an excellent shape, the ribbon that's inside the leather grip, excellent, sword knot, ideal, P-shaped guard, excellent. Overall, it's all a very close match and it's, you know, in scale. Again, they can vary a little bit, but it's nice that it's kind of scale correctly. Reproduction swords, they're often way out. I mean, it's very common to have um, grips and guards that are just massive compared to the originals. That's the most common thing that happens, just way oversize. Uh, and in terms of then blade proportions, they can often be way out. So yeah, grip, guards, overall proportions, curvature, weight, all within the original category. All looking good so far. Let's quickly talk about that cold steel, because it is important to talk about. Because uh, again, this is the one that everybody's going to compare to. So the cold steel, as I said, it's a functional, decent sword. But frankly, <laughs> it's a bit harsh, but it is not that close to a 1796 like Avery Sabre. It doesn't look that close. The blade profile is not quite right. The handling characteristics are way off. And there's little details that are just niggling, like, you know, why does it have this just little, you know, knob on the top, okay? British sabres of this period pretty much all are flush. The peen just goes straight onto the back strap. And this is peened, so it's, this isn't a nut. Why couldn't they just peen it straight onto the back strap like the originals? It's frustrating, okay? And, and even things like the, the, the P-shaped guard is, is, is just off. The ears here are in kind of the wrong place, even though they can vary. Ah. The blade profile doesn't actually look like a light cavalry saber. This actually looks more like some of the, um, well, it looks like an Indian reproduction. That isn't to disparage a swords made in India, but I mean the, the cheaper end of them, okay? Um, so, right, cold steel. Let's talk about it more. This one was actually a factory second. It was discarded by cold steel because it was too light. So it was chucked in a bargain bin and a friend of mine in America picked it up um, for another friend of mine as a kind of, well, this is actually one of the best that cold steel can make because they've actually thrown it out because it's too light. Uh, so this one is 928 grams and I've seen many push more like 960, 970, 980. So it's only a little bit under, 
Uh, notice from the weights I talked about with the originals, this actually cold steel is still within uh, the historical weight range. It's just towards the higher end of how you find originals, but it's within the historical weight range. And you think, oh, therefore it must be about right. No, because there's a lot more to swords than just weight. And this is where the distal taper and complex distal taper is hugely, hugely important. So the windlass does indeed look actually way closer to a real 1796 like cavalry saber, which is fantastic. But if we just talk about handling characteristics for a moment, this cold steel has a 21 centimeter balance. Now, I said the original had 17, the windlass also has 17, but even that doesn't really tell the full story because this cold steel does not have, a, it's reasonably thick, but it doesn't have a hugely thick shoulder. It does not have complex distal taper. And as a result, you end up with kind of not enough mass at the hilt, a bit too much in the middle, and then the tip is a bit club-like. Now they've tried to fix that by not flaring it as much as the originals. So they've actually thinned the profile taper down to try and fix some of that. And it's done a little bit of the job, but not enough. So this cold steel does indeed handle more like a club and not that close to a 1796 light cavalry sabre. Um, and that's a shame, okay? Most people in HEMA will not be able to buy a 1796 light cavalry sabre. They have massively rocketed in price. Um, they're out of reach for a lot of people. And obviously, if you don't live in the UK, they're even harder and more expensive to get. And so most people, if they ever wanted a light cavalry sabre, were going to get a cold steel if they were actually going to cut with it. And they might be under the illusion then that it's a big, heavy, clumsy chopper, okay? Now it is a chopper, but it's not clumsy. So there's the cold steel for you. Um, it is fine as a backyard cutter. Uh, it's tough, it'll hold a good edge, it'll smash through things quite successfully. It's fine, it's like a lot of cold steel products, is that it's, it's club-like, industrial, not that great in terms of handling characteristics, but tough and will cut things. You want to cut a pig, it'll work fine, okay. But it won't handle like a light cavalry saber. Okay, so that's the cold steel out of the way. If you can get a cold steel cheap, there's still a good backyard cutter, but don't be under any illusions that it's that close to a 1796 light cavalry saber. Back to the windlass. Is it like an original 1796 light cavalry saber? Yes, okay. It fundamentally looks the part, handles the part, um, and is therefore incredibly close to the original swords. All sounds amazing, doesn't it? Okay, absolutely revolutionary for sword collectors, for sword cutters, for humorists that can finally actually get a saber. Now this is massive. If you test cut, and test cutting is a bit overblown, okay, but it is important. Everybody should do some test cutting. You don't need to obsess over it, but you should do some test cutting. And ideally you want to test cut with something that handles like a real sword. And also give, gives you some idea of what the real deal will be like to handle. So this is huge. Anyone now can just buy this off the shelf. They're usually in stock now, quite cheap, and have something that is like the real deal. That is absolutely huge. Are there any downsides? Because obviously right now it's all glowing. This is basically a million times better than the cold steel, which it is. Um, are there any downsides? Okay, so obviously I have to bring up a few niggles because that is important. Firstly, I bought this sword entirely. I wasn't provided with it for the review, so I'm not gonna show any bias here. Um, niggles, okay, it's floppy, okay? It is a very floppy sword. <laughs> now, the, I have seen in some reviews people complaining that it's just way too floppy and they don't like it and they, don't, they can't use it. It's really, really important to note here that British cavalry, well, British swords of this period are typically very springy and quite wobbly. That's completely normal. Now, it's a little bit too wobbly. So if you do a flex test on this, which is where you put the tip onto a weighing scale and you press down with your hand until the blade starts to bow, that'll give you a simple way of testing flexibility. My original Osborne there has about five kilos um, flex and this windlass has 3.5. So you think, okay, it's too flexible compared to the original. Wait for a moment. British swords actually of that era have 
very flexible blades. If you look at my two heavy cavalry swords, for example, which you know you think would probably be more brutish, they actually are around about two to two point five kilos of um, flex. Um, spadrons of the era, often two to three. Other sabers I've tested, two to three, up to about four. So that Osborne is actually quite a stiff example, and many originals were floppy and if you see this footage from the Royal Armouries when they did some test cutting with an original like cavalry sabre you can see just how floppy the originals actually were. So in terms of a niggle it is a little bit too floppy but they were a lot more flexible and floppy than you necessarily think. Why is that? Well I'd have to discuss that in a whole video but in a very short <laughs> tiny short segment I will just explain that in the late 18th century British swords uh, went through a testing procedure that was introduced by the army where they had to pass certain proofing tests and significantly they were put in a machine that flexed them um, to quite a significant degree and they had to return true and then they had to beat them against wooden and metal blocks as basically a testing procedure and that is what gives them the ordnance inspection stamp because they've been through that process and for more expensive officer swords when you see warranted or warranted never to fail that's officer swords going through the same test procedure. Now, if your swords are going through that kind of procedure, it encourages makers to make swords that are obviously flexible so that they survive the tests. And so it's no surprise that British swords in that era are very flexible because that would be the optimal way to get through the tests. Doesn't mean, of course, that it's the best way to make a sword, but it's the best way to pass the tests of the time. And so that's what they were like. There we go. Um, right, so it's a small niggle, it's a little bit too flexible, but it's not as much of a niggle as you think because they were flexible. Right, other things, um, it's sharpened on the back edge, okay? Um, so this section here, which on a, on a flared out tip we often call a yelman, um, although obviously in the British Light Cavalry it doesn't actually kind of notch out, it's just flared slightly, but you could still call it a yelman. Um, it's sharp, just as sharp as the front edge for about a foot of the blade. Now, the British swords of this era typically did not have a sharpened sharpen back edge. Um, and you know, you can argue about the reasons why, but I'd, I'd say it's quite simple that they didn't use back edge cuts. If you look at British sources of the period, they did not use the back edge. So it wasn't considered important, they didn't sharpen it. There are always the odd exception to that rule. I've got an original sword that does have um, a sharpened back edge, but the vast majority, if you look at all my antiques, the vast majority that are service sharpened on the front have blunt back edges. So they have sharpened the back edge, is that necessarily a problem? Well, no, not really, okay? You can just go, oh, I'm gonna test cut, but I won't use the back edge because it wouldn't have been sharp originally. But if you do want to test cut with a back edge, because some swords, of course, did have sharpened back edges, you've got a sharpened back edge. So I don't mind that so much. It's, it's, it's not typical for the originals, but it doesn't affect the sword in really any way. And it is kind of nice if you want to be able to do some back edge saber test cuts. And, you know, for example, if you um, like Polish sabers and Polish sabers frequently have a sharpened yelman, you might want to buy one of these, because is this close to a Polish sabre? Absolutely. British cavalry sabre this e uh, sabres of this era were based heavily on Polish, Hungarian, Austrian designs. Okay, so this is very close to a Polish sabre. It has the sharpened back edge. There you go. Buy this. Do some back edge cutting. Um, other niggles. I mentioned about this bend here. I think that's slightly off. It's a tiny deal. You could just bend it a little bit back. Um, not really an issue. And what else? Well, the polish. Do you notice how shiny it is and how my fingerprints are showing really badly on the blade? And I'm going to have to go and wipe this down in a minute. I think they've taken the polish a bit too far. The polish and the grind has gone a bit too far. I don't think it needed to be quite this shiny. And of course, if they hadn't taken away quite so much on the polish and grind, um, it might be a little bit heavier. And at 835, you know, fine. But I would have liked it more like the Osborne around 870. I think my perfect range for a light cab would be 850 to 880 would probably be the absolute ideal. So it's a tiny bit under, and clearly other people that have had these are within my ideal range. That's a minor, minor deal. The most important thing about this kind of sword is that it handles like the real deal, okay? You could also put it on the wall and it will actually look like a 1796 light cavalry saber. So, as a humorist, as a sword collector, how is this? Well, it looks like the real deal, it handles like the real deal. I've not test cut with it yet because I do my test cutting outdoors and I live in Wales and the weather is foul and it's just been raining almost all the time. I will test cut with it soon, although I've seen other people do lots of successful test cutting with it uh, and that seems to be working fine. It came very sharp, 
I could go and test cut with this now, no problem. And that's interesting because previously Winless didn't actually export swords sharp. I don't know what's changed there because it was a rules thing shipping um, as their country. And this one has come razor sharp, which is fascinating and very handy as a humorist because not everybody is familiar with putting an edge on a sword. Um, and it just means it's ready to go. So do I have um, anything else to say about it? Well, there's... After the humorists um, issue, oh, I will also say, because of the kind of zealous, overzealous polish and grind, the rivet going through the ears here and the, the peen section here, they're completely flush and almost gone. And I, again, I, I would like to see a slightly less extreme grind and polish um, on, on this. But again, pff, doesn't really matter. As long as it stays intact, it looks nice. I don't really mind that so much. So from a humorous perspective, buy one of these, you'll have something that handles like a original cavalry saber that you never could have got before without spending a lot on an antique or a lot on uh, a custom sword. So you can get the real deal, you can have some fun with it. Uh, from a antique collector's perspective, is this sword going to be a problem on the antiques market? And potentially, yes. Um, knockoffs age reproductions, this kind of thing, are really common. If you look at any auctions, pretty much every week there are antique dealers um, posting up knockoff swords. Some of them might know and some of them don't, and unfortunately unscrupulous dealers get better at modifying swords all the time. Are we going to see an influx of these on the antiques market passing off as originals? Undoubtedly, of course we will. Now, how can we protect against that? Well. We do have on the blade, we have this windless Marto marking on the langet here, okay, just above the langet, okay, on the thumb side of the blade as a right hander. That is the thing to look out for because it's engraved quite deeply in the blade and to get that out you will have to grind quite deeply into the blade. So if you ever see a light like, cavalry sabre for sale, one of the first things to do is to look at this flat part of the blade and see if it's been ground away because the only thing you should ever really see on a trooper's version of this sword of that time is an inspection stamp. You'll pretty much never see anything else because um, makers' names were put on the spine. Um, only officer's swords really put it on the um, fuller. So look for that. You should see an inspection stamp on most light cavalry swords and you shouldn't see any grand away section where that windlass marking has been taken away. Um, there are a few other cues, but ultimately this is very close to the original, so antique collectors, you know, be careful, do your due diligence, um, it is something to look out for. Now, onto the future. What do I think of this product and where it's going? Frankly, this is revolutionary for um, humorists, for sword collectors who um, want to collect swords that allow them to get the handling or the cutting ability of originals without having to spend massive amounts of money on antiques. It is absolutely massive. This is the way to go in the future for reproduction swords. And remember, this is not an expensive custom. This is a very affordable, off-the-shelf, readily available sword. This is the absolute future. This is exactly where we need to see reproduction swords going. So any niggles that I have with this are really quite small. This, this is fundamentally what we need to see um, with so many different swords on the market. This is exactly where reproductions need to go because it's absolutely epic that any of you can just get your hands on something that is, you know, the real deal effectively. So that's it. Um, would I recommend this sword? Absolutely, okay. I didn't need this because obviously I've got antiques and I do cut with some of my antiques. I didn't need a test cutter. I didn't need a reproduction. I bought this for science, okay, for you guys. Um, for the HEMA community at large, for our HEMA clubs, to see if it was really worth having. It is absolutely worth having, and I will keep this, and in fact, I will now do a lot of my test cutting with this, because I very carefully select antiques for cutting. You shouldn't just use all antiques for cutting. I use basically lesser condition and cheaper examples that aren't so valuable for my test cutting. Um, I will just retire those now into display use, and mostly, if I want to cut with a Napoleonic era sword, or Sabre specifically, I will cut with this because there's no reason to put the wear on the antiques anymore. Lastly, if you are going to do some test cutting with these, please have some respect for the weapon, okay? 
this is a sharp sword and it's a sharp sword famous for again cutting limbs off cutting heads off it is very very dangerous okay it's not just a kitchen knife it is a butcher's blade okay please be careful with it when you swing through watch out where your sword is going make sure you've got grip retention don't smack into anything just please be careful with it because it does have the power to do massive massive damage and that's it absolutely fantastic product um I didn't actually mention anything about the scabbard, but you've seen it in the photos. The scabbard is really nicely done. The throat is perfect. The rings are, um, are, are the, the perfect size. They're not like the cold steel one. The brass brazen, okay, that's actually a really nice touch that you don't get on reproductions normally. It's the correct weight. It's the correct size. And if there was one niggle I would mention, which I don't really have an issue with, um, it's lined with some plastic. So in the originals of these, they tend to have um, wooden slithers that go basically the length to keep the sword re basically retention okay and it doesn't have those it has plastic but you can't tell unless you put a light down the uh, throat and really look um, uh, quite deep in there uh, so I don't think that's an issue at all but you know again you might find that it is so in the UK I bought this from the night shop 280 pounds and they do free shipping over 200 pounds anyway so yeah 280 pounds that is an absolute bargain by far one of the best reproduction swords I have ever seen, particularly when we consider that price point. And it's the only reproduction Napoleonic saber that I've ever seen that is frankly like the real deal and therefore one that I would want to have personally. So that's it. I, I know this was a bit rambling. There was quite a lot to say. When we compare it to the originals, it is incredibly close. Uh, when we compare it to the cold steel, it blows it out of the water. Uh, is there any reason to have the cold steel now over this? Um, potentially only two reasons if you can get it cheap in the u.s so the um in in the u.s you can sometimes get cold steel a lot cheaper than we can particularly in um, bargain bins and stuff so if you can pick one up cheap um you know significantly cheaper than the windlass still do that uh if you really want a very rigid blade which is actually much more rigid than the originals yeah maybe you might want that as well but for me i wouldn't bother with the cold steel one anymore unless it's a real cheapy this is absolutely fantastic with the last caveat being that i need to long-term test it with lots of test cutting to see how it holds up over time but um i'm fairly confident that's going to be all good so thanks for watching i really hope you enjoyed the video um, please subscribe if you haven't already